everybody, and welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing with the Global Transformation Office team. Um, really thrilled to have Kevin Beer here today, um, and we're going to do some debunking um, and have some conversation afterwards and um, see if we can't uh, dispel some myths, I think, as well. So Kevin's going to talk about DevOps versus ITIL, um, and um, hopefully explain to those of you who don't know what ITIL is um, a little bit about that as well. And I'm going to let Kevin take it away for probably a half an hour or so, and then we'll have some live conversational Q&A. So if you join us um, on Twitch or on BlueJeans or wherever you are, um, we'll, we'll bring you into the conversation or we will just ask each other wonderful questions. So Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Diane. Um, my name is Kevin Baer, and I'm the co-author most recently of the Phoenix Project. Um, before that, I wrote uh, the Visible Ops uh, guidebook with Gene Kim and uh, George Spafford. Before that, I wrote the Definitive Guide to IT Management and the Adaptive Enterprise for Halo Packard. Before that, I wrote a book on PKI, PKI called uh, Managing Certificate Life Cycles, um, where I started to send all those books before that into more technical topics. Um, but um, I am a, just a little bit of background on me. Um, I am a serial CIO CTO, but don't hate me for that. Um, I started out um, as a developer, quickly got kicked out of development, became an infrastructure person and held every job in infrastructure until one day the CTO of my company was no longer present and I was standing in their office and got made the CTO. So um, literally, uh, my career has been a, a continual challenge of my confidence um, and um, always kind of pushing me to a place where I'm not comfortable. Um, for some reason, I accept those challenges. And <laughs> um, so a lot of that has brought me here today. And I want to make sure before I start talking that I don't come across as like an ITIL advocate. It's not really the, my point. I have contributed to the ITIL uh, in all truthfulness. I have uh, recently contributed to the ITIL practitioner guide. Um, a lot because I wanted to make sure that that guide started to focus more on continuous improvement, which is what I believe will actually take us out of this false choice trap that we're in right now. So I want to talk to you a little bit about DevOps versus ITIL. Basically, this is a false choice, and I want to talk a little bit about why it is. So first thing what we're going to do is, is this is my buds here at the, the Global Transformation Office on the left, Andrew Clay Schaefer. The surly guy next to him is me. Um, and John Willis is to my right, and Jay Bloom is to John Willis's right. We all have different backgrounds. Andrew, I like to say, basically invented DevOps with Patrick Dubois. Um, I like to say that John Willis, um, who is just an incredible sage, um, lots and lots of years, 35 years plus, I believe, uh, in this industry, working from everything from basically traveling around to every DevOps days that basically ever happened, um, to working just really, really hard in the uh, software-defined networking space, um, and just doing lots of really, really cool stuff with the containers and technologies and DevSecOps now. So um, I had to kind of gush on John because he's like top of mind right now. Um, Jabe is amazing. He's finishing his PhD at Carnegie Mellon in actual design, the only, I believe, university in the world to offer a PhD in design proper. In other words, not design of a thing, but what is design. So Jabe among us is what I would call kind of a real treasure in synthesizing things from kind of parallel worlds and bringing them into technology and showing us how they're relevant and how they can change our thinking. So to that end, um, I want to talk about where we're going to go with this. This talk is literally not to describe what ITIL is to you, although I will tell a little bit about it. Um, and it's not to advocate it to you. It's about an intersection of interactions that can be problematic in our organizations. Um, and I want to also suggest that in digital transformation, which most of us in infrastructure and development should get a little twitch whenever we hear that word, because a lot of times that's meant that we've been thrown hand grenade after hand grenade of unreasonable set of expectations and impossible changes that we can't make ourselves. So I think enterprise transformation tends to feel like some lofty, crazy, far off goal. Um, and in the process of those transformation projects, which is how they often unfortunately you know, kind of materialize, we struggle with existing processes versus novel ideas. And one of the things that pre-exists in most shared services infrastructure organizations in the enterprise is a pro an approach called IT service management and a specific approach to that called ITIL. So we're going to talk a little bit about these archetypes. Um, some of that's mildly useful, um, but I think it can help you understand maybe some frames. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what ITIL and ITSM are. Um, and then 
yes, there are some ISO things in here. So there's reasons to do this stuff that don't actually have anything to do with whether these are the right things to do or not, which is a very interesting problem. Um, and there are actual versions of idle. So when you're talking to people about it, you may not be talking about the same thing. And I think that's really important to understand. Um, but when you do understand ITIL, you can actually begin to understand that the way ITIL may have been implemented in your organization has nothing to do with what is in the guidance. This is pretty common. People take it literally when it's not literally. Um, it's guidance, right? And then basically, I want to talk about some of the places where you're going to have these interaction friction points in your daily jobs and, and what they may feel like. This all leads to a future series that I'm going to do. I'm not sure how we're going to do it here, but you're going to see me doing it everywhere, which is expounding on this in a lot of ways. So this is kind of a first talk to kind of that I'm going to put out in the community to start to just talk about this. And then as I move on, I'm going to start to move into more how we actually break these conflicts, um, which ones are the false conflicts themselves, the assumptions behind them. I'll break these down Socratic style eventually um, with actual um, evaporating clouds, current reality trees, I'll use some tools from Goldratt's theory of constraints eventually. So today is just to kick us off, like what is the topic and why is it a problem? So you may have heard some of this friction happening in your organization. Developers constantly saying these things. Gosh, why do I have to interface with a ticketing system? I just want something from another human. Right, and so why do I have to fill out this form that has choices in it that don't make any sense to me just to get an environment, right? And a lot of places, people still talk about servers. If we're still talking about servers, I think we're lost, right? And, and, and this is a sign in many cases when developers are asking for servers, that's really not necessarily what they really want to be asking for. In many cases, we've forced developers to ask for raw materials to make things that they need to do experiments, right? And so one of the friction points we get is developers have an emergent need and or maybe even an ephemeral need. I just need to try this thing out, tear down the environment, blow it back up. I just wanna see what happens. I don't need to put this in production. Um, and so that kind of ephemeral need runs right into a very process-oriented structured approach to delivering things to people, services, products, all those kinds of things. And what happens when it hits that process is sometimes, if you have a ticketing system, those particular workflows get broken down into individual work queues. They get sent out. So you put in a request for a environment. That request, after you say small, medium, large, and you kind of do all that sizing, um, that request will be sent to possibly two or three different teams to fulfill parts of that work in the breakdown. What happens is, is in many cases, you will hit two to three different queues of work that are not aligned across each other. So what you will instead maybe get is the equivalent of if you ordered a car, you might get a headlight, two chairs, and a rim. And you're going, wait a minute, I ordered a car. And they're like, yeah, 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 um, but this other group has to do a thing, this other group has to do a thing, and then you'll get the rest of the parts. And you're like, but I ordered a car. I don't want to have to build a car. Right? And so very simply, we start to have this fundamental, very simple breakdown. And a lot of people said, well, infrastructure, um, uh, you know, basically infrastructure is code, how we solve this. And I was like, well, actually, there's a social problem here that actually has to do with understanding each other's frames and developing empathy for why that's a thing. And so when you understand the relationships um, from a developer standpoint, and again, I'm going to make stereotypical, archetypical type of statements here that are very broad and maybe um, mildly offensive or limiting in the way they're put. Um, I reserve the right to be much more reasonable later on in conversation if we have a talk, but I, I'm trying to make impact here. So one of the things that can broadly happen in these organizational groups is development typically has a very small amount of relationships to the developer. In other words, this is one thing that we do on purpose, right? We don't have 35 people talking to a developer in a sprint. It's important not to, right? We're talking about, hey, we need to take very powerful skills and put some focus on them, like horses have. They're not blinders, they're focusers, right? The extraneous information makes horses very nervous. They're not developed for that. So, or never evolved for that, right? Um, our modern world. So we need to focus and we do this with sprints. We do this with stories. We do this with reducing scope of development, right? 
if you move to operations, typical infrastructure operations in an organization, it's many to one relationships. Every operator has potentially hundreds of requests and relationships from discrete people that all have different priorities, but everybody thinks their thing is the most important. And your job is to work at scale. And scale means one person relating to many, many, many pieces of infrastructure, thousands. Um, and so one of the problems with scale is, is if everything is unique, scale breaks. Because I have to master a ton of different things. So one of the things you will hear from infrastructure people, and you will think of slowing things down, is their attempt to homogenize whatever is being offered or put into production so that they can maintain scale. And that is a real conflict point. When you have a one-to-one -one or one-to-twenty relationship from a developer, and you have a thousand-to-one relationship for an infrastructure person, they have completely different mind frames about what is necessary to achieve what they have to do and how they're rewarded. By the way, infrastructure people aren't rewarded for very much of anything. They're yelled at when outages happen. And so one of the things that we develop is a risk aversion inside of infrastructure. And one of the things that I think, as you look at some of these kind of patterns here in, in conversation, what you're seeing is structured versus novel thinking. Some people call this old thinking versus new thinking. Right? Operations tends to look to the past because at the end of the day, they're left with everything everybody makes. And so they have to think about things like you almost think about children, like rearing infrastructure, <laughs> right? Um, and which is why I maintain there's a level of phenomenology in infrastructure uh, groups. There's a level of care that doesn't make any sense. Like when you understand how this infrastructure doesn't care about you, how it crashes, how many things are involved with it, most infrastructure people that I talk with, when there's a problem, they're more worried on a level that actually has care in it. And I find this really unique. Um, so a lot of times you'll see this archetype kind of battle between developers who might have a lot of passion and infrastructure people that might seem like Spock from Star Trek. But that's actually not true. The caring and the infrastructure side manifests itself very differently. And, and, and so what, what I actually think is, is that both groups, when they're in their passionate and best frame, may not actually be able to have the kind of empathy staying in their frame that they need to to get things done in a modern world. So what we're looking at is old frames of thought that are built around stability. The IT infrastructure library was really made to actually stabilize the approach to managing infrastructure, provisioning infrastructure, and maintaining it. And in the British government, uh, when this started in the 80s, there was a lot of different results coming from different, the same kinds of projects. So one of the things the British government thought to do was, hey, let's get all of our sage people, all the people that have been working in this space for a while, and let's build a best practice library of what we know works so that we can share that, not reinvent the wheel all the time, and get more stable, reliable, and predictable results from our IT spending and our IT projects and operations. So if you think about it, the goal was stabilization, predictability, and consistency. This is not something you ever really hear devs talk about, right? It's novelty. We're gonna build a new thing. We're gonna fix an old thing. We're gonna bridge things that work together. All of this is change thinking. But if you go into operations, change is risk because they know all outages, basically, are the unattended consequences of things we meant to do. And, and, and so they have this cause-effect relationship that many people don't. And the more that development organizations are traditionally shielded from that kind of on-call uh, incident response type of scenario, you may not be able to have empathy for the fact that your release basically means a lot of people's kids and operations don't get to see their parents over the weekend. And um, I worked at one particular organization and one of my people in an OSS group um, that worked for me uh, many years ago was a really, really, he's still a brilliant guy. And his daughter, he had a brand new daughter and, and she literally never saw her dad because every release started at 6 a.m., uh, actually 6 p.m. on a Friday night, He'd come in at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And a group of people would have to just sweat over this thing. And you know, maybe by Monday it was stable. And so what I realized was is this whole process was putting everybody in their worst position, right? But we were all just doing what we thought we should do. 
And what I said was, is how come what we're doing results in all these people being separated from their families? And so we started a project, because we all agreed that was dumb. But we all thought that there was not a better way to do this right now. But we agreed to start a project, and we named it after the kids that were getting left behind. Because that's what's important, sustainable releases, right? And these groups came together and started to work across these processes to figure out how to do it. So here's one of the kind of dispositions that can be hard for the, when you're in ops, you see a developer running up to you, you see them chasing a shiny object. Now, maybe all developers aren't quite as outgoing as Tigger, right? They're not all type A's. I certainly wasn't. Um, and, you know, I think we all kind of, there's a spectrum of our social behavior that we even individually as a sign wave to it. And, and so, you know, you could see a developer running up to you. Well, if you're in operations and, you know, somebody in dev comes up to you, you might look like this guy, which literally says it's not necessarily the personality of the individuals. Remember, it's kind of the archetype of the organizations. Um, and the ops guy is like, listen, appreciate that you saw that I'm here, but I'm already doing something and I'm already kind of like, I'm kind of already worn down about what I'm already doing. And I maybe got yelled at yesterday for something that wasn't even my fault. And, and, um, and I'm worried that I might lose my job if that happens again. And, and there's a lot of worrying here about performance, about making mistakes, and about leaving the building. And whether it's warranted or not, um, it's there and it's real, it's palpable, especially during times like this. So whenever Eeyore finds out about a new release, <laughs> he kind of sometimes feels like he's getting jumped on by Tigger, right? And if you try and resist the release because you don't think something's right or unstable or something smells wrong, you're just a bad guy. It's gonna happen, right? So there's this kind of almost pessimism that kind of develops over time. And maybe what happens is we give in. And so change becomes the one pivot point that operations can control. The, that when you go to do it, change. You're gonna touch my backyard. So if we refresh ourselves, this whole notion of IT service management, remember I said ITIL is like a de facto standard worldwide approach to IT service management. And so basically what is IT service management? It's really basic. It's like a process-based management approach, right? To deriving business results that are less terrible than they are awesome um, so that we can continue to function as an organization, right? It's basically a management approach. Now, um, ITSM, there's a lot of approaches to ITSM out there. Um, I can tell you that none have gained a lot of traction in comparison to the ITIL. Um, and like I said, originally the ITIL was published by the British government, but now it's actually owned by a third party called Axelos, and they're marketing it and developing it. So you'll see much more aggressive um, maintaining, publishing of guidance, certification, all that kind of stuff. Now, I will tell you, Axelos, for the ITIL, I, they do provide certifications for individuals, like, hey, you mastered this material or whatever. But, and you know, certifications um, are, are what they are. Um, to me, a lot of times they just become um, confirmation bias afterwards. <laughs> like we stay stuck in the things we get certified on because um, uh, we see it as like a sunk cost, right? Um, so I really feel like um, that, you know, the certifications they do individually, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk bad about that because I think a lot of people put a lot of effort into that and the mastery, and I think that's a great thing. Um, but they don't certify bodies. And that kind of leads me, you know, uh, so just to finish this up, you know, um, I'll use the uh, all Cravassier is Brandy, but not all Brandy is Cravassier. Um, you know, all ITIL is IT service management, but not all ITSM is ITIL, just to confuse you. Just so you know, the BS15000, courtesy of the people that brought us the inch, the pound, the mile, and the qubit, um, I believe the British Standards uh, kind of BSI codification of service management using the ITIL, which is called the BS15000, they made it a standard, um, is really, really useful. And I'll show you when we look at these pictures, because I'm, I tend to use the BS15000 picture of ITIL 2, yes, there's versions, um, to actually just as the simplest, most baseline way to say this is what IT does. And um, so the ISO 20000 actually, which came out not that awful long ago, is a certification to show that you are actually doing these processes in your organization and that they are functional and have controls. So this is really a way, if your organization is ISO bent, and I said this in the back in, in, the, in, the, in the original uh, part of the presentation, the beginning part, um, 
where some of the reasons we adopt ITIL don't actually have anything to do with ITIL. There are a lot of organizations that are really, really hell-bent on ISO certifying everything. Um, and so they're going to want to say, hey, we want to have this ISO 20,000 cert to show that our IT processes rock as much as our manufacturing or our back-end business processes or whatever. They're trying to win a bid or, you know, differentiate in the market. So the 20,000 winds up getting dumped on people, and then all of a sudden they're like, we have to have an approach to meet this. And ITIL becomes the approach that's pretty much default. But neither the BS15000 or ISO are ITIL. Basically, they're certifications for organizations to show that they are doing those things correctly. And we won't talk anymore about that crap. All right, um, but you should know, this drives a lot. Also, there's another slide that I don't have in here because it's a future conversation, which compliance in organizations drive standardized process frameworks. And one of the reasons is there are standardized audit frameworks for IT, like COBIT, Control Objectives for IT. Um, and so, you know, they are actually, and I'm going to throw this crazy word out there, ITIL and COBIT are orthogonal. So ITIL actually describes the processes and does have some controls in it. Change management, by the way, is a preventive control. It's one of the best kinds of controls to have. The problem is, is when it's run wrong, it prevents all the good things. Right, and only lets through risky things. So um, kind of one of the ways we have to start to think about the relationship between audit and ITIL is, is that when you're a person doing DevOps and you might be working in a collaborative scenario, you might be like, oh gosh, you know, that's what's killing us is doing that um, change management process, filling out all those forms, having all those people get involved in my change and say whether it's good or not. That's ridiculous. Well, it may be ridiculous and you it probably should change, but the audit framework that's associated with it in your organization that allows you to demonstrate compliance and prove that your controls are actually being used and work, that's tied to that. So when you start to think about changing processes, you have to start thinking about a bigger picture in the system of how do we demonstrate that the things we say we do, we actually do. And that wherever there's risk, we have appropriate level of preventive, detective, and corrective controls. So one of the things that we don't really get exposed to in the development side of things a lot is, you know, GRC, right? Um, compliance, regulation. We may get exposed to it in our particular vertical. If we work in finance or if we work in a particular vertical, there are regulations associated with that vertical. But we may not be aware of the fact that our tech friends in the IT groups or in the operations group have a whole host of things that they have to comply with and the ability to demonstrate that they can reproduce critical systems as exactly as they need to be. Um, so, you know, never mind the fact that they're a key part of certifying, um, you know, SOCs, uh, the underlying capabilities to be able to demonstrate that our financial reports are what we say they are. So this kind of stuff is tied to these processes. So when you throw a Molotov cocktail at change management, I get it. I've thrown many myself. Matter of fact, I've detonated change management programs only to find out when I have GRC people running up to me going, um, we've got examiners from the FDIC that want to see this, and you just blew up the process that tells us we have that. Oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like, whenever you're thinking about these things, there is a system around them. And while I think we need to improve and change and eliminate a lot of these concepts with modern attestation done by machines, um, those kinds of things, um, we, we have to get there through a process that allows us to be circumspect and understand what are all of the attachments to these things. It's just like service dependencies in software. You know, we've all said, oh yeah, you can turn that server off, nothing will happen, only to find out things do happen because people build dependencies that we didn't know about, right? And so uh, that kind of stuff, um, it, you know, happens with processes in a very big way. Just understand that all work in a process comes from somebody and goes to somebody else. And all of those handoffs that form that chain are called a value stream, right? And so one of the biggest things we have to look at is in a value stream, how do we actually make changes to get rid of things that are causing completeness and accuracy issues or are causing value to be lost, or even worse, somebody's name is in a value stream. That is a credible organizational liability. <laughs> like we need to have a system, not a person, right? Um, and and so I think the, uh, the the larger kind of thinking around how do we create value? Is there value without compliance? 
you know, what is the end state of value is a conversation that needs to happen and does not happen when we say your ITIL is stupid and your DevOps is scary. It prevents that conversation. Because first of all, DevOps is not a best practices library complete with a framework for process controls, functions, uh, as well as behaviors, right? DevOps is a novel socio-technical cross-functional alignment capability that organizations have and or don't have. And, and so it fits into something like this. And DevOps could be the catalyst for improving these processes cross-functionally and turning them into something that doesn't look like the idol anymore. It looks like what your company needs, right? And by the way, that was the original point of the idol. None of the original authors said, adopt this the way we wrote this and take every process area and make it a functional person. No, they never said this. And so what a lot of the ways people have adopted idle has been with this literalism that has no basis in the way it was presented to people to be used. So I want you to understand that it was not intended to become dogma, not, but it has because humans. So I think what's important is, is that we figure out how to undogmatize it because it was never really intended to be that way. When it gets coupled with compliance and it gets coupled with expectations and reporting, it's really hard to change. So got to be circumspect. So like I said, the idle de facto standard for service management, um, it does come in versions. And this is really great because our, ver our tech industry is a, you know, completely obsessed with version dot numbers, which I think is bizarre. Um, but revision control being what it is, it's nice to keep track of things. So idle 2, um, starting in the early 90s, um, came, to the, came out, um, it was actually fun the first real kind of formal idle guidance, I believe. There were some books in the 80s, and the problem with the books is they were very incomplete and they're very, like, almost just like a snapshot of that time period. Um, the way we referred to things, like MIS, I think, was in those books. Like, there, you know, there's, there's a lot of old terminology. Um, so what you'll see is, is as these revisions come out, they trail what's happening because it's consensus-based. So it's never gonna be pushing what's happening. So right off the bat, you have a difference in DevOps people tend to be more involved in pioneering, just by archetypal scenario. And you kind of have the town planners and the settlers with the ITIL folks. So pioneers and settlers and town planners don't get along really well because <laughs> they have very different priorities, right? Pioneers don't care about settling towns. They're just off. But they do come back to the towns to get supplies and borrow things, I'm sure, right? And so I think there's this kind of strange relationship between people that actually mature the way things get done versus people that are on the novel side. So I think we don't need to be bimodal. Like, I don't love that concept. I call it bipolar IT. I really believe that at the end of the day, all of us have to learn to modulate what we're doing based on the context that we're in. So... Big, big, big problem because that's hard for us to do. So ITIL 2, very, very simple, very much process focused. Um, I think it had like, I can't remember how many process areas. I wanna say it covered like 10 processes and like maybe one function or two functions. Um, in ITIL 3, we kind of went again, process-based approach, more processes, more functions. Um, ITIL 4 changed completely, which is kind of interesting to me. ITIL 4 said it's more about practices and process but it's not just process and there are values and we want to have an outcome-based approach. So it's much more kind of incorporating more modern language about digital things. It's incorporating much more modern language about value chains and value. It brings mention of lean and DevOps. Um, matter of fact, there's even, they modified their uh, product project management. Uh, their, the uh, British government had a project management standard now that Axelis owns called PRINCE2. It's basically the, British version of like PMP, uh, our project management uh, certification that's been pretty pretty uh, common here. And Prince2 actually made an adjustment for Agile, which I thought was very interesting. I don't complete, to be honest with you, I don't completely understand it. Um, but um, I think it might be genius or it might be crazy. I can't actually figure it out. Um, and I, it's not because it, it's a bad idea, it's just I need to do more work on that. Um, but point is, is that the approach changes over time, but it always trails. And I think that's very different for developers to understand. Maturity comes later. Now, maturity also can lead to stubbornness, right? So this is where these things can, you know, I, I kind of have a joke about how a lot of times um, we're wandering through the wilderness 
and somebody finds something that works to get you to the other side. And so what happens is enough people take that path and somebody finally decides to build a memorial to the fact that this is the way. So they build a memorial, everybody gets disillusioned, knocks the memorial over, and their subsequent generations just trip over it. And I think, they don't even know what it means, that it's just in the road, and I actually feel like that's the state we're at right now with DevOps and Idle. A lot of us don't even know why we did it to begin with. When we try to undo some of these processes or start to make them lighter and faster, we run into compliance problems, organizational problems, reporting problems. Hey, don't move that thing because it's mine and I invented it. So there's a lot of hooks into this stuff. But as we even see, there's a progression with the versions of Idle. And so what I would suggest to you is, is there's a notion that some change can happen. It's about how we interact with each other to make it happen. So I want folks to stop a, to taking guidance like this from the outside with like idle and saying, this is exactly what we will do. I would love people to say, hey, the idle was invented by these folks in the government and they had this problem and they had these constraints. We have these problems too, but we have different constraints. So maybe what we need to do is not do some of this, do some of that and adjust it so we can deal with our own constraints. You just made a recipe for yourself. Right, so if you ate every recipe that was out there, I'm guessing you wouldn't be in a good place. But if you made recipes that sounded good to you and actually then said, I can adjust these to my diet and my particular needs, then you are actually doing something that's really cool. You're taking care of yourself, right? And so I think one of the things that we, in maturity models that we've got to understand is why we're doing what we're doing and where it came from. More and more, more of our guidance about what we need to do at the actual tactical level can be informed by these frameworks like SRE, which I think is a much more modern approach to looking at how we do with service delivery and service operations. Again, not as heavy as idle, has some of the same language, some of the same thoughts, but a completely reimagined way of doing it. Right, so I, I like to say, what are our constraints? What are the universal principles that we identify with as an organization? Now, how do we take our, those principles and adapt them to our constraints so that we now have approach internally that can work? This is what Toyota did. There's an article that Eliyahu Goldratt wrote many years ago about this concept. It's called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. And um, I will definitely make a, a point of figuring out how to get that link. Um, but um, it is a great article. You can Google it. Um, just type standing on the shoulder of giants space L-I-L-E, which is E-L-I, Goldratt. You know, and, and that article is essentially about how you can appropriate practices into your organization. It, oddly enough, also is very controversial uh, in one sense. It shows why lean adoption fails at some companies because of constraints and how Toyota actually built a version of the Ford production system that's what they wanted to build, but they had no space, no money, were bankrupt, could only make a car if they had an order, and only could buy enough inventory for one car. Where do you think one by one flow came at the lowest cost? They turned that constraint into an advantage that allowed them to produce one product that was completely different than another product on the same line at the lowest cost. And in Japan, you don't have huge inventories of car. You order your car exactly the way you want it and you get it in about a week. So the idea of auto distribution in Japan is much more about consumption and tied to uptake. And also they learn a tremendous amount about what people want, right? And, um, and so that interaction is very personal. It is very rich in terms of the data they get. And at Toyota, one of the most important things to remember at the beginning of when they started to really take their improvement bent their philosophy changed and their phrase even changed. They had this great phrase, better cars for more people. It put improvement before the work. In ITIL, there's a continuous improvement notion in ITIL 3 that gets added and in ITIL 4. The problem is, is it's not the central engine of everything they do. In the Toyota production system, you improve your work before you do it. You have a systematic approach every day where your interaction with middle management and your managers are about your ability to improve things towards a target that everybody shares. Not what to do, how you think about what you do is the coaching. They don't solve your problems for you. This builds, this daily approach, their kata, their improvement kata, builds scientific thinking in the edge at manufacturing. 
to the point where some Toyota factories can do hundreds, if not thousands, of reorganizations themselves without HR. That's powerful. That's really powerful. And it's not because they're God. There are messy and low-performing Toyota factories, just like every other company. But this is a really neat example of how reconstructing and thinking system-wide and understanding that the most important capability is to incrementally improve, I, I think is pretty amazing. So when we look at ITIL and we say, okay, ITIL has all these process areas. What if we had DevOps style efforts going to continuously improve these process areas and align them with our new, more important modern needs? So we're collaborating on this versus fighting. It's a big deal. I know a lot of people don't have energy to get in and fix everything, but a lot of us love doing that kind of stuff. So I think one of the things that can be really healthy is, is if this is stuff that's in your environment and you're facing clashes, maybe step back and think about your entrenched position and if it's working for anybody. Are we making effective change, right? Are we trying to use politics to change social things versus empathy and interpersonal relationships? I think that that's one thing that we can start to think about. So again, here's some pictures of the idol. So these are three different versions here. I mentioned that there's version two. That's the top one. And it's pretty low tech. I mean, you can actually make a version of this in Emacs. Um, the, uh, you know, text, right? But, sorry about my uh, fidgeting. Um, and if you actually look, it's really simple. This is everything that you know, you need to deal with at a large scale level, like a, a high level, right? In an IT organization, you've got kind of the delivery things like capacity management, service reporting, and all that stuff. But right in the center, control processes. And I think if I'm a dev, I look at this and I'm like, control is right, right? And, and because we get to control the change and the way configurations happen. But if you think about this, that's the hot spot because that's where a lot of people in infrastructure realize this is where bad things start. Like if I let a bad thing in through this, now it's an outage. Now it's my problem. Now it's my weekend. Now it's, you know, potentially an executive um, escalation with my name in it on a con call, right? Um, it's a bridge that nobody wants, right? So, but what we found, Gene and Kim and I actually back in the day when we wrote, uh, with George Spaffer wrote Visible Ops, we found, um, we've got to, some permission from our CEOs to put on pith hats and go study our best performing customers, which was awesome. And um, so we went out and we found out they all had these three things in common that was unbelievable. They all called things different stuff. First of all, the reason why we have an ITIL, one of the best reasons, standardized names for processes, right? Because then in operations, you can say, if we do this work, and we do these processes, we need these kinds of people and these skills. So then you could standardize position names and actually have the ability to hire in a fair way and helpful way. So that was kind of one of the ideas, right? So now you see how deeply entrenched this can get into an organizational model, into people's positions, careers, and trajectories. So when you come and say, I wanna get rid of this, you threaten a lot of people's existences. So we might use a more tactful way to do this, <laughs> right? But this is a really great thing for you to think about if you're a developer, what the hell does IT do? All this shit in V2. Now we call it different things. There's more things that we've added. Um, there's a lot of compliance related stuff that's not there. So that's a V2 picture that started out in the 90s. Then all of a sudden V3, somebody got really, really awesome capabilities with Excel um, or some sort of PowerPoint or something. And we made this wheel and because we hate the idea of linear processes and we wanted to show ITIL as a life cycle. And I think, I think actually there's some valid things that are in here. If you look at this wheel, the, the notion is, is that kind of everything starts with a service strategy in the center of this. So we have a grand design about what we're trying to do, what services and things we need to offer to help meet our company strategy. And that's projects. So those things would then go above it into this service design thing and then would flow right into after design being implemented at some level. Now, I kind of call this little wheel that's in here, I called it out. It, it's an old school concept called plan, build, run. And, and um, it's not very, very agile or modern. Um, this is like the waterfall approach to delivering <laughs> infrastructure. Um, and so I take flack for saying that, but I think this is still very useful. Again, we understand in transition, things are moving into production. We have more control around them. When things are novel up towards the top, 
you know, in, in the design phase um, and in the strategy phase, there's less constraints. But as it moves through this process, it gets more and more locked down. When it gets into service operation, that thing is pretty close to static. So from, a, from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, so again, an interesting picture here but and showing motion. But again, look at this continual process improvement ring on the outside. I don't even know what that means. This whole thing kind of looks like a manhole to me. And I feel like at the end of the day, this is just the edge of the lid. Um, it doesn't have any motion. It doesn't show any integration. I think that's supposed to mean that all this stuff is getting improved. But I like the idea that it's at the center. And what actually feeds, strategy feeds process improvement. We have to do these things and we can't right now. How do we get those capabilities? We have to improve into them. Some of them you can do as projects, but not all of them. So I think there's a notion that strategy results in projects, products, focus, which means we're not doing things, right? Um, and so I think one of the biggest things that we have to understand is, is as we develop those things, we are constraining things. Um, so developers used to having less constraints, operators fully constrained. Different points of view. Now, IDLE 4 below, I took a picture of IDLE 4 here, but this isn't IDLE 4 all of it. You can't show all of IDLE 4 on a freaking single page now, and it bothers me. They have these weird amorphous arrow drawings that just have ideas and concepts. Um, I think we need more than that kind of stuff to really have these conversations. But what I will tell you about IDLE 4, um, it is kind of the uh, IDLE du jour. Um, and, and basically, it's got to focus more on practices than just processes. Um, because I think the authors realized that people needed to know what the things needed to be done look like, also the values that drive those, and the outcomes that they can provide. So I think they're trying to get people to think much more, like they were in version three about a life cycle, but now I think for the first time, idle four goes outside of IT operations and gets into a lot of other things. Um, it has interfaces with software development, it has digital kind of notions in it, um, it even has DevOps notions in it. Um, and so, but again, imagined from this frame, the stability frame, right? So we need to understand that these frames are important. Stability frame is not a bad frame. At the end of the day, you actually benefit from this frame as, as, as well as have problems. It does keep you out of a lot of conference bridges, hopefully, and escalations, right? Um, but maybe you need to be part of those too to get some of that pain, because it, it Man, I'll tell you, there, I've sat on a lot of conference calls. I don't talk on them as an executive because I think that's just terrible, um, But uh, unless people ask me to. But I, I do think that it's important to understand the morale of your team. And I think it's really important to understand the interactions and what they sound like and feel like. Not specifically to call people out all the time, although sometimes it does help to take people aside and talk to them. But what I find is, is that it's important to just know. Because the words you say as a leader, as a manager, as a director, can either, and I, and I don't like either ors, but what I say is, is that they can cause folks to feel boxed. And they can produce behavior that is not the kind of behavior you want, versus kind of more optionality thinking, and including people in the intent of what's happening, and starting to try and build a bigger frame that more than one person can see. I call it expanding the movie screen, right? We all have a phone screen and we can turn it in 16 by nine, but there's no comparison to that than a letterbox on a movie screen. We can all see a lot better right there and we can have a shared frame, right? One of the big reasons why directors love that long format, that crazy letterbox format, that's what they see when they film. That's what they want you to see, how they're choosing their shots, how they're choosing all of it, where it starts and ends. And so when you get that wider frame, you're now seeing like a filmmaker. So frame adoption, the idea of can you see what's in the frame of somebody else a little bit? Can you move your frames together so that there might be a little bit of overlap in what you see? That is DevOps. Like I maintain that it's not the full then affinity getting crossed. Like we just don't have dev on top of ops in circles, right? We have that affinity that is about 80-20. Um, and I think that that's really important. And these areas where we meet each other to interact, to make value, have to become focused on differently. Not as why we can't get it done, 
but what we're going to change to get it done together. So I talked about the friction around um, patching is one of the areas where, again, it's change. Um, developers don't want to deal with the fact that in many cases, um, things have to be patched. And where you patch them is one thing. I mean, a lot of operations folks are still doing what I call this old house, which is basically taking servers and upgrading them uh, in production, patching them in production, and basically caring for them. Um, that's a lot of work. The more modern organizations are basically building, you know, kind of uh, what I call like a, a merge approach to building infrastructure in the sense that we're building it in source control. We're building the images, we're building and combining all the artifacts together to build a server on the fly. And we don't necessarily, and all of the stacks above it, we don't necessarily actually now um, have to focus on modifying things that are in production. Because I always say I'd rather patch 15 or 20 different um, builds that we have in source control than I would patching thousands of servers that are all going to react differently to the same software. I would rather mint them from scratch, right? And one of the reasons why we do this in many cases, it's not the solution for everything, is you solve two different things at once. Infrastructure people are patching and worrying about much smaller set of things, which allows them to have more mastery of those configurations versus having hundreds of thousands or like most organizations, an unknown amount of different configurations and trying to master something as it breaks. And so I feel like one of the more kind of empathetic things we could do is work together to say, hey, we can architect a way of doing this that frees up massive capacity in operations and it also allows developers a lot more flexibility. I just, I love stuff like that, right? Because we get to win, right? And we get to also slide past a lot of really, really silly assumptions. And you can say they're silly in retrospect after you've been through them. They're really hard when you're looking at them, right? The consequences. So we see the friction in change management. We see the friction in the way tickets happen. Um, we see friction in the fact that, um, you know, when people need to, uh, I've heard this classic tired line, you know, our devs don't respond to incident callouts. Um, well, again, it's the frame. It's a totally different frame. And we need to make sure that we both have context for each other's frames here and share a frame together about how we resolve things together. Um, and, you know, I can, I can tell you, I've sat on release conference bridges um, a lot. And, and I can tell you that one of the things that drives operations folks nuts is and builds a lack of confidence across that relationship is the amount of config files that just get botched in releases. <laughs> and ironic as it may seem, most ops departments that I've been in have not been really crazy about source control. And a lot of software is written in, in operations. Some people call them scripts, um, but they are not in source control. And so it's very common in operations to have config file problems and batch files that don't run and scripts that don't work correctly and break. That's normal, but nobody outside of that group sees that, right? But when developers bring a thing in and their config file doesn't work, right? It's because the operator doesn't understand it in many cases. Um, and it becomes a like, why don't your config files ever work? Why aren't you shipping me things that are run ready? And then all of a sudden we get this big conversation about, we need to build a path to production. You guys need to satisfy all these requirements before we'll let it in. And what we basically institute is a troll in front of a bridge that asks you what your favorite color is, right? And so from a developer standpoint, this is not satisfactory. So you get these friction points where we're trying to do things and the processes just they don't fit. And so the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that if you look at these processes that don't work where all the wars are, there's a, there's a ton of deer paths out around the processes. One of the things I, I often say to people is, why don't you look at the deer paths and move the processes to those? That's where people are. We used to build, you know, roads on cow paths and deer paths. <laughs> like we learned how to follow things, right? Um, that's why there's nothing straight in Pennsylvania. But I think that um, the, the, the idea of how we are actually getting things done and looking at the way they're supposed to get done tells us a lot about how the supposed to get done is working. And, and so, I mean, I hear the conversation 
it, it is one of the most old and tired things I've ever heard. An infrastructure person who sits back and says, you know what, everything would be great if people would just follow my processes. Inside the dev's mind, he's thinking something that's probably pretty similar. It's just he hasn't articulated processes with drawings and, you know, all kinds of crazy, you know, meetings and sticky notes and done all this stuff. He, basically, in their mind, they think about an outcome they should be able to get really quickly. And, and so I think that we have to step back from defending what exists because neither, none of those things will get us where we want to go. And we've seen that. So friction's a clue. It's a symptom. It's most awfully not the problem with the process. So if we stop here and we decide that we need a better patching solution or we need a better ticketing solution or we <laughs> need a better call out solution or we're going to buy pager duty for devs or whatever it is, maybe step it back and, and go, why do we have to do that? Right? I'm not going to tell you to five why this to death, but these aren't, these are symptoms. So one of the things I want to talk about about these things, you know, so I want to kind of introduce this conflict and I wanted to briefly frame it a little bit. And I also want to frame it as completely useless, but I think it can be made useful. And, and so I, I often tell folks to be very, very, very careful at intervening in these battles. Um, oftentimes what's being presented at face, isn't, is at face value isn't really the issue. It can go back to the archetype and the frame. And many times I've heard brilliant folks in operations trying to explain why they need to do something, but they aren't even aware of the overall frame that they're in compared to the frame of somebody else. And, and, and so frame thinking, by the way, um, is kind of something I'm throwing out here. Um, and I think maybe this is something that Jabe and myself probably need to do a talk on at some point. Um, and Jabe's really great at explaining the concepts of frame thinking. I'm pretty decent at explaining how they play out um, and, and what they can look like in technology. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to understand frames is that um, we make a lot of assumptions about why people do things. And very seldom are we right at first. And, um, but we think we are, and because of gut feelings and our past experience and stimulus, right? So we bring a lot of bias, no matter who we are, to these things. And one of the things that we have to do is adopt this notion, I've learned it because I've been humiliated enough times by thinking I have the answer, um, is this notion of humble student, right? When you're learning a new thing, understand you don't know it and that you're trying to get closer to it. Humility in understanding is very important. And when you think you understand another person's point of view, but you keep running into this rock of resistance, maybe you don't understand where they're coming from and how they're measured and what their fears are. And so what we have is these stances that become almost political. And what I find is, is that when we polarize, we seldom, we really, really, seldom optimize something together. And in order to optimize, we have to understand both parts of an equation. What you're trying to tell me and what you're trying to tell me are probably both right. And so if we step back from the fact that what you're trying to do is probably the right thing, the way we're doing it doesn't work right now. That's a big deal, right? And so I think, can we frame, can we frame these things with as we talk to each other with a little bit of understanding of the stability, the goals that we have in operations versus the goals that we have in development. Um, and I think that as the more we see it, we see that these aren't verses, they're different parts of value chains. And everything we build only really delivers value when it's in operations. Matter of fact, business school definition of operations, harvesting value, from operational assets. In other words, we build software, we put infrastructure out there, we want our value back. So operation, the continual elimination of the constraints that the software provides, only in operation of that software is it eliminating constraints and providing actual business value. Now there are the things that we can make that are patents or code that we could sell, that does happen. But by and large in the enterprise, the way we make value is by running those things that we built. So if you understand as a developer, the only way your software is valuable is when operators can operate it without talking to you 24 seven, you're gonna wanna maybe make that happen 
together, <laughs> right? And they want to be able to take that thing that you hand to them into that next part of the life cycle. And they want to be shaking hands and going, high five. We got the next chain here, got all of our backs. We're getting value now. That thing you gave me has the potential to generate value. And it's my job to realize that potential. That is powerful. And when we think about that as a relay race together, if somebody drops that baton, we don't finish the race. So if we're standing there arguing about who has the baton and how it should be handed and what color it should be, and if it's handed only on Thursdays, like that's a bad thing. So understand that the goal of operations is to be able to safely absorb as much change as the organization needs to, to allow it to meet its mission and strategy and satisfy the needs of its customers. So if change is not at that velocity and does not have a successful spin, in other words, your change success rate is very low and you need to make a lot of change, you know what you're gonna create, a lot of incidents, right? In the early 80s, GM bought a ton of robots during the labor crisis. Some of us are old enough to remember when gas was not cheap and there were labor riots um, in the auto factories and um, the economy was terrible and interest rates were 14% and things were bad. And so GM says, well, people are kind of a problem and we're having these striking auto workers, so maybe we should just deal with machines because they're a heck of a lot more simple and cheap. Well, boy, was that wrong. They spent, I think, billions on buying robots during the middle of that maelstrom. And, but they wound up throwing them out a few years later. And then they asked Ford's CEO, I think, during that time, saying, hey, why didn't you guys join the arms race when GM did and buy all the robots? And the CEO of Ford said something to the effect of, basically, we realized our biggest problem was consistency of practice. And if we sped up the rate of delivery without consistency of practice, we would just accelerate the rate of delivering defects. So I think this lesson is something that we need to think about together, which is in the car industry, a lot of things have moved really, really far towards the direction of design for manufacturing. In other words, let our design limitations be the things we think that we can manufacture quickly. So those are called enabling constraints. This is something that a lot of people don't realize. Sometimes by limiting your focus, you can do better. In blues, we call this seven bar blues. In a sense that we know we just have to name a key and everything after that has a basic structure. Why do we do that? Because it's the same core possessions? Because it allows the vocalist to improvise over top of it because they know where the song's gonna go. That's an enabling constraint. It enables the expression extemporaneously of pain, joy, which is a very searching process, right? So when we think about, hey, how are we gonna work together? Um, we understand that sometimes enabling constraints, making things that we know can readily be av available in production. Now, the other thing is, is that production has to move enough to support the ongoing strategies so that we're not having to use old crap all the time. So there's, there's a hybrid thinking in there. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver, but the other is gold, right? It's like the Girl Scout theme song. I used to pick my daughters up from Girl Scouts. It's the one thing that permeated me, and it is operational thinking, which is these assets that we know have been eliminating constraints and providing value for a really long time. You're telling me this new friend is going to be really cool, and I want to make this new friend, but in order to make this new friend, I have to keep the old ones working. I got to keep those relationships going. And so... That is a different way of thinking. Um, I also like people that when they want to make a new friend with you, also consider the old friends. Because <laughs> I'm an old friend of a lot of people. I don't like to get dropped, right, <laughs> whenever they have a new one. So I think, you know, if we start to think about these processes, these cold infrastructure things as more human, relational, emotional, and sometimes not really logical, um, and also far more complex than we might think, we actually can approach them with the humble, you know, the humility that we need to actually start to talk about how do we socially come to a common frame or enough of a common frame so that we can actually improve these things together and actually get different outcomes. So I've seen many organizations, and I, and I think this is something that I need to probably bring to the forefront of, how are organizations, and I can talk to some folks, actually melding these two approaches? 
and creating something that is neither ITIL nor traditional DevOps in a sense. Traditional DevOps, that's funny. But legacy DevOps. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, that is what we're after. We're not after legitimacy for name banner sakes of agiling and DevOpsing and idling everything. We're here to deliver value to our business and some of these things make that easier. If they don't, <laughs> then we need to question what's happening, right? And, um, and then the last thing to say is, is that um, I think one thing that we forget, and it's, as developers, I think it's important to understand, is ITIL is actually a very descriptive versus prescriptive set of guidance. So I'm going to give you a little bit of power here. Not that I have it, but this is the thing I learned. Um, question the prescriptive nature of the adoption. Is that really what people had in mind? But don't do it in a conversation with the next person like that's running that process going, I'm pretty sure what you're doing is not what they had in mind. Um, because now you're gonna have an argument about points of view and odds are that's not gonna be productive. But what people can do is actually start to say, hey, um, I, I think I get why some of these processes are important, but can you help me understand why they're important to you? And though, boy, oh boy, talk about a list of things, right? It's like asking the UPS guy what he does. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what's really important is listen to that because that's what you're gonna come up against if you say that stuff's dumb. And try and understand why they think that stuff's important and ask them what happens when it breaks and how they feel. And um, I know all that takes time. It's a lot of session buildup if, for some people, but I think at the end of the day, you're, you're not gonna just waltz around these processes and continue to successfully build things in an organization for long. It's just not gonna happen. And so I think in order to help people do things, we have to understand why things are the way they are. And with that, I'm done ranting about ITIL and DevOps. <laughs>